I'm Katie and thanks for checking out this message today. We're glad you and your family are here and we would love to get connected with you. One easy way you can do that is text River Connect to 97000. You can also visit our website, therivertrch.cc, to learn more about us and some upcoming events. Lastly, if you would like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321, or you can head to our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy today's message. Good morning again to you. Uh, good morning to all of you joining us online. Man, it is so good to be back with you today. We did our annual pastor swap last weekend, and so um, those of you that were here, you know Pastor Josh Yates uh, spoke, and I pray that that was a blessing to you. I love Josh, and um, I spoke down in Lake Orion, and I drove whatever it was, I think it was like 14 hours down to Lake Orion, and I was like, dear Lord, what am I doing with my life? And then, uh, no, it was a great time, and the church there is wonderful, they were very kind, uh, but man, I really miss being with you. And that is the case anytime I am away. I just, uh, not to get too sappy already, but man, I really love you. I really do. I love our church. I'm so grateful for it. So thankful to just be a part of this body. And uh, I mean that. So, um, well, this month we have been sort of uh, pausing to look at what it is that we're supposed to be doing as the church, okay? And um, what are we supposed to be doing in this world is really the idea. And uh, we've been looking at uh, not what we're doing as the river, uh, what we are doing as followers of Christ. You and I, we are the church, right? Doesn't have to have a name or a brand or a building or anything. We, you and I, followers of Jesus Christ, we are the church. And what is the church supposed to be doing in this world? And so um, a few weeks back, we looked at what the, the mission of the church really is. And that, of course, is to reach the lost. And um, that is our mission, given to us by the Lord Jesus. Share the message of salvation with everyone we can. And uh, so that is our mission. From there, uh, last week, we looked at the topic of what you and I are doing this morning. We are gathering together as God's people and that is a good thing. That is what we're supposed to be doing. And uh, we're commanded not to just let what we're doing this morning slip away. Okay, that's a command in Scripture to do what we're doing this morning. It's great. Well, then this morning we, we come to the topic of growth. Okay, growth as a Christian. And, and when we talk about this topic, we've got to ask a few questions. Uh, one, are we growing? That, that's a question I've had to ask myself all week. Am I growing? Or has that stopped in my life? Am I growing? Uh, and then what does it look like if we are growing? Like, how would we even identify that? How would we be able to, you know, to know the answer to that question? And then, finally, I want to ask this question. What happens if we don't grow as a Christian, and does that really matter? Um, well, we're going to try and look at those things this morning. To do that, uh, we're going to open the book of Philippians once again. So Philippians chapter 1 is where we'll be this morning. If you've got a Bible, uh, please open them with me to Philippians 1. I want to read a couple of verses, Philippians 1, verse 9, down to verse 11, and then we'll pray, okay? The Apostle Paul, praying for the Philippians, says this, This I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Let's pray, okay? Let's ask the Lord to speak. We need him. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would open your word to us. Lord, that you would open our hearts. You would open our eyes to see you this morning. You would open our ears to hear and our hearts to receive. I pray, Lord, that you would reveal, that you would speak, that you would encourage, that you would help this morning. We need you, Lord. 
We ask for you to speak today. It's in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. So that is the question. That's the question I've asked all, myself all week, right? Am I growing as a Christian? Are you growing as a Christian? What does that even mean? Well, to get right to the point, it means that you and I are becoming more and more like the Lord Jesus. That's growth. You're either more like him, and so you have grown, or you are less like him, and you need to grow. More like him in the things that you think, in the things that you feel, in the things that you say, in the things that you do, in the things that you want. Growth as a Christian is one of the first things that we learn about when we come to faith in Christ. It's called discipleship in the Bible. Discipleship. Growth as a Christian, hear me, growth as a Christian is very simple. It is Christ-likeness. That's what it is. Becoming more and more like him. Now, we'll never become him, right? We will never be God. He is God, right? Uh, but, but the more that we are like him in our thinking, in our feeling, in our words, in our actions, in every way that we possibly can, the more we become like him, the more we have grown. But growth is also knowing him and loving him more. That's one of the ways that you'll know if you have grown is if you know him, and we'll talk about what these mean, but not only know him, but love him more. Are you growing in this? It will result, all of this will result in a life that is more and more in line with what he would want it to be. Okay, There's a, a practical effect to all of this. It's what it means to grow as a Christian. So this is really tough because what you can do this morning is you could very easily just let the words sort of pass in and out and, and really no change happen, right? But, but what's tough, but what is needed is to ask ourselves, am I really growing? And then to be ready for that answer. Are we growing? Because we should be. And, the, and, and what I want to ask is this. What happens if a professing Christian isn't? What happens? What happens when things are, that are supposed to grow don't? Think about this, right? If a, you plant a, an apple seed into the ground and uh, it never grows. Uh, nothing ever sprouts up. Uh, no leaves, uh, definitely no apples, right? Nothing ever sprouts. What do we assume about that seed or about that tree? If season after season passes and that tree never grows and it never produces anything, let alone apples, what do we assume about that tree? We would assume two things. Either one, it is diseased and something is wrong with it and something is preventing it from growing. Or number two, it's dead. It's not alive at all. Folks, this is tough, but for many professing Christians, this is what their lives look like. Years and years of professing Christ and years and years of no change whatsoever. No change. No, no desire for, for holiness or godliness. No love for Christ. Again, what are we to assume about something that is supposed to grow but then doesn't? That thing is either dead or there, or there is something that is causing it to, to not grow. There's some disease or something that is preventing its growth. Hear this. If year after year goes by, and I am not becoming more and more like him. What do I have to assume about my spiritual life? Because it doesn't really matter what I say. Either I am dead spiritually and not really a Christian at all. And that is something we have to square with. Like, am I actually a follower of Jesus Christ? If I'm not growing, what does that mean? Do I, do I not know him? Am I, am I not really spiritually alive? 
You go, well, that can't really be the case, right? I mean, it can't be that somebody thinks that they are a Christian or that they're alive and they're not, right? That can't be. Well, it's exactly what happened to the church of Sardis in Revelation 3. They thought they were alive, but they were really dead spiritually. And Jesus said, I know your works. You have a name. You have a reputation that you are alive, but you are actually dead. So, so, If there's no real growth in Christ's likeness, either I'm dead or there's some disease in my life that is stopping, that is stunting growth. And that's, folks, that's what sin does in our lives if it is is unattended. It is a disease that prevents our growth. But the question is this, how does a person come to the place where they believe that they are alive, how would you and I, how would we ever come to this place where we believe we are alive when in fact they are dead? How does that happen? How does a person get there? Ready for this? Here it is. They ignore the issue of growth. To get to a place where you think you're alive and actually you're dead, you have to ignore the topic of growth. You just have to ignore it. The person that gets themselves into this place, they might have had a spiritual experience, right? They went to a retreat or they attended a church service or they walked forward or they prayed a prayer or they they went to a growth community and they met a, a group of people and they became a part of something, whatever it might be. But somewhere along the way, the Holy Spirit was speaking and whispering into their ears and saying, listen, Turn to me. And somewhere along the way, they consoled themselves with their past experience. Now listen, I don't point the finger at anybody. I am just as prone to do this as anybody else. For God to come to me and say, listen, your growth has slowed. And for me to point to past stuff that God has done. I want to do that to console myself because self-confrontation is difficult. But man, is it needed. Man, is it necessary. Somewhere along the way, the self-deceived person has consoled themselves with a past experience and ignored the reality that there is no fruit and there hasn't been. Have you ever done this? There's no real repentance In our lives, sin can just be done and excused and moved on from. No real sorrow over sin. No no real turning from those things to God. No real love for the Lord Jesus. That's not deepening. Is that deepening in your life? A love for his people is a mark of us as believers growing in Christ. No real desire for holiness No real desire for change. No deep longing. Somewhere along the way, the self-deceived person has settled into the idea that we can just say that we are Christians, but never change at all. Never grow. But that cannot be. That cannot be. We cannot say we are Christians and have no growth and think that we are spiritually alive. I'll confess to you, I used to be one of these people. Uh, After my parents came to Christ, I was a young man. We we began, of course, (laughs) immediately going to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, every time. It felt like the doors were open. We were at church, right? It's like my parents came to Christ and suddenly, this is what we were doing. We were church people now. And... uh, You know, I would have told you at that time that I was a Christian. And you might have thought I was a Christian because uh, I went to church every week and um, I sang the songs and I served in the kids' ministry and I even taught kids the Bible and um, I served at events and I went to camps. I remember a lady one time who, after I got done teaching uh, in the kids' ministry, uh, she, she said, man, the Lord 
just used you. I was listening outside the door. And man, it's just amazing how God was speaking through you. I remember that now, knowing I did not even know the Lord when I was doing that. Interesting, huh? See, anybody who really knew me could have let the whole thing down. How? Because I wasn't any different. Nothing had changed. There was no growth in my life as a follower of Christ. Um, I was a Christian in name only. It was kind of like a, like a Tigers fan, you know? I wasn't on the team, but I had the hat, and I had the shirt, and I had some of the memorabilia, and I knew the stats and the statistics, and I could tell you what was going on, but I was not on the team. You know what I'm saying? I even went to the stadium, and I was a part of it, but I wasn't on the team. And so there was no growth in my life. I was a, I was a Christian in name, and I was ignoring that reality of needing to grow. You see, the self-deceived person is in great danger. It's a danger that Paul warns about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. He describes what the end of all things is going to look like. It's a time I believe that we are actually in right now. The Apostle Paul says this, he says, Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, talking about the coming, the second coming of Jesus Christ, it will not come unless, look what happens, the falling away comes first. He goes on, he talks about, you know, the man of sin, the the Antichrist, the son of perdition is revealed. But understand what Paul is saying. In the end, uh, there will be this thing that happens, and it is called the falling away. What is this? This is, it has to be, it has to refer to people who have professed to be Christians, who now say, uh, uh, no, no more, right? Like, I'm good. I, I don't, I, I'm, that's not what I am. Never grown, not Christians at all, but professed at one time. That's what we're talking about. Dead spiritually, but, but for a long time maybe, thinking alive. And in case we think this is not what Paul is talking about, we're warned again. 1 Timothy chapter 4, and says... The Holy Spirit expressly or clearly warns that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to, watch this, deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. What does this mean? Well, the Holy Spirit is warning us. He's warning all of us who profess Jesus Christ today. Do you profess to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Go ahead and lift your hand if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Okay, the warning is to you and I. It's to you and I. The warning is that in the end, some of us will literally walk away. You say, well, what does this mean? Does it mean a person is going to lose their salvation? No, it does not. You can't lose what you didn't earn what you didn't purchase. It means many of those who profess to be are going to be revealed to be not what they said they were. The situation of the world, the condition of the world, the the, the things, the pressures going on in this world are going to finally reveal what that person was all along. 1 John says it this way, They went out from us, meaning they were a part of the church at one time but are no longer, not meaning a local church, but meaning the church. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest. It means they are made clear as to what they actually are, that none of them were actually of us. Um, There were people who were a part of the the churches professing to be followers of Christ, but who actually were not at all. Some of them were uh, deceivers. Uh, Some of them were self-deceived. But for whatever reason, they left the church, capital C, 
and what they were became clear. They were not his followers. So again, how, how do these things happen? Well, they happen by ignoring this issue of growth. That's why I'm hammering so hard on it, because that's how we get ourselves in a spot like this. We ignore the topic of growth. See, we can say anything we want, and we can be a part of anything we want, and we can do anything we want to do. But listen, if there's not actually any growth in our life, something is, is very, very wrong. The question, it's, it's tough, are you the same person that you've always been? Man, that's a hard question. I've asked myself all of these questions this week. Am I the same person that I've just always been? Ask my wife, am I the same person? Am, am I growing? Am I becoming more and more like him? Or am I just the same person I've always been? For all the years of being a Christian, are you, are you more like Jesus? Are you just as angry as you've always been? Or have you grown in Christ-likeness and become gentle and patient and kind? Are you held by the same sins that, you, that you've always been held by? Same addictions, same struggles, same trouble. Or has there been growth in those things? Is there Christ-likeness? Do you still love what you've always loved? Or have things changed? Or has there been no change at all? Have you grown? Have I grown? And how would we prove it? How would you prove it if... If someone asked you this question, how would you prove that you are a true Christian growing in the Lord? What would you say? What would you point to as proof? What would I point to? Well, uh, we've got Christian posters in our house. Wow. I've replaced all my t-shirts with Christian ones. Okay. All my music, Christian music now. Great. Great. We have Bibles on our nightstands and on our coffee tables. Fantastic. I think a lot of people would say, well, I go to church every week. Okay. I pray before every meal. Every meal. If that's not proof I'm a Christian, I don't just dig in. I pray first, right? Come on, right? Like, we know these are not evidences. These are not proofs of anything. And if this stirs you... Something where, where reality is, is hitting you right now, if, if reality is hitting you and, and you don't know if, if you really actually know the Lord at all, let me just say that's a good thing. As painful it is, as it is to have the veil pulled back, it's an important thing, it's necessary because we're talking about eternal matters. Don't resist the Lord right now. I would encourage you uh, at the end of this gathering to come and, and talk to one of these deacons. Come talk to me or, or you know, one of, somebody and say, hey, listen, I don't know. I'd encourage you to do it. Get it straight today. But maybe you are a true believer. Maybe you are a true Christian, but you've also recognized that, man, growth has really slowed in your life. And the question is, why? Because there's always a reason why. Always a reason why. Well, we come to, finally, we come to Philippians for just a moment to hear what the Lord says to us here, and we're given evidences of our growth. It's, it's sort of a test, if you will, of what it will look like if we're growing. So Paul, there, verse 9, he says, This is what I pray, that your love may abound still more and more. Their pastor is praying for them to grow in what way? Look what it says. In love. Love. You say, love for whom? Love for the Lord. And love for others. This is what I pray for you for. That you would grow in love for the Lord. And love for others. And by love for others I mean for other believers. And also for those who are unbelievers. I am praying that your love abounds for him. But also for others. For the church. And for the unsaved. This is one of the primary measurements of growth in our life. There are three questions there. Do you love the Lord more now than ever? Can you say, I, I love the Lord more now than ever? If not, something's wrong. 
Do I love the lost? Am I burdened to see people saved? If not, something's wrong. And do I love the Lord's people? If not, something's wrong. And we cannot be like those who ignore these things, ignoring growth and thinking we are okay. We have to ask the questions Are we growing? Do we love the Lord? Are we growing in that? And are we growing in our love for others? That's the first test. How'd you do? Did you pass? Okay, let's see. Next, we are to grow in, verse 9, it says, in knowledge. Now, let me just say, this is not just information. We are never told to accumulate more and more information about Christ, about the Bible, about God. We are, we, are, we are never told to do that. We're not told to simply know more than everybody else about the Bible and about these things. No, Christianity is not an accumulation of information. It is a relationship with the Lord himself. And so true growth is growing in relationship. It's growing in knowing someone. Uh, you know, as my marriage grows, it is entirely relational. It is not informational. Okay? I, I, I mean, 25 years of being married, uh, I think I have the facts down. You know what I'm saying? I think I, I think I know my wife, the information stuff. I think I've got that. But I am growing all the time relationally with her. Right? I'm, grow, I'm growing in my relationship with her. So the question here is, are you and I not growing in our information of the Lord? Are we growing relationally with him? Do we know him better than we once did? Again, not knowing necessarily more about him. Do we know him better? You might say, well, what does that look like? Well, I tried to think about this, right? In my life, uh, this looks like this. I have come to know that the Lord is completely reliable. Have you learned this about him? He is 100% reliable. <laughs> that, that he's always in control, that things are not ever out of control, and that he is always good. This is something I had to grow relationally and learn about who he is. It's been tested over and over. I've learned that he always does what's best. I've come to know this. I've come to trust this. I've also, I've come to learn that I cannot exhaust his love for me, which does not make sense to me because I could exhaust anybody's love for me. Just give me the opportunity, you know. <laughs> I've learned that he's always with me. I have learned that his, his discipline of me is always needed. Always. Always necessary. And it's always for my good. I've learned that he always wants to hear from me. I've learned that he hates evil. He hates my flesh. He hates my fleshly ways. I've learned these things. I go on and on about what I know of who he is. Are you growing relationally with him? That's the question. All right, well, the next is this. We grow in all discernment. And this is a word that means to see things and to understand them. And it's asking if we have grown in our understanding of the Lord and his ways. Uh, so it's kind of linked to, to knowing him. But do you know and understand him better? Do you know what he's doing? Do you know what the Lord is doing? Or are you completely confused all the time? An example of this, I, I used to not understand God's discipline in my, my life. I used to think he was, you know, it was either Satan or it was, you know, demons or God was angry and hated me and wanted to smash me. <laughs> I now understand he's my father, and he loves me, and, he, and, and his correction is good. It's painful. That's what the scriptures say. It's not easy. It's painful. It hurts. But man, as a, as a loving father corrects his child that he loves, and man, I'll tell you, I need this correction all the time. Let me give you an example. Just a week or so ago, the Lord woke me up, 2 a.m. I don't know why he does this at 2 a.m. I'm like, Lord, you know I'm up for like 16, 17 hours in a day. You know what I mean? Can we talk at like noon? And he's like, no, 2 a.m. because you're not thinking about anything else. But um, 
He woke me up and showed me something really, really painful. Really, really painful. The Lord, I felt like he replayed every scene in my day where my son Judah was trying to have my attention and my time. And every single one of those scenes was me pushing Judah away because I was too busy. Every single one of them. I was just busy in my brain. I was busy in my heart. I was, I was busy with stuff. And I saw, literally, it was so many things. At the end of the night, the kid was sitting next to me and leaning on me and asking me to read Calvin and Hobbes to him. Which if you don't know what that is, just get up and leave right now because, no, I'm just kidding. You got to go buy the books. Okay, no. But here he is just leaning on me and asking me to read. And I told him no. And I told him he needed to go to bed. And it's like painful. I cried at 2 a.m. with my foolishness. But man, was it needed, right? God was, was, was revealing this so that I would then be different from that point forward. And it has affected me every day since. I, I wanted to just wake him up at, you know, three in the morning and, and apologize. Hey, buddy, I'm so sorry. It's like, oh, what, what, you know? So I didn't do that. But I couldn't wait for him to wake up. I just couldn't wait. Because I wanted to get this straight. But man, it's just one of the many examples of the way that the Lord, he cares. He cares about me. He cares about Judah. He cares about my kids. You know, he cares about these things. And I, and I, and I used to think that, you know, uh, it's better to not be corrected in these things or something, you know. But now I know it's, it's better to be corrected, right, to, to change. I need to change. I need to grow. Are you growing in your understanding of what God is doing in your life? Well, that's part of your growth. Paul goes on, he says something happens when we grow. Verse 10, that you may approve the things that are excellent. The word approve there means to test something to determine what it is. And here is another growth, another proof, proof of your growth. As you and I grow in him, one of the things that happens, get this, this is one of the things that happens, you become able to test the things that happen in life. So that you know what, excuse me, what they are. And then what to do about them. That's what Paul's saying. I pray that you'll be able to, to test the things that come to you in life so that you'll know what things are good and what things are not, what things you should be a part of and what things you shouldn't be. I mean, think about what this means to have things and you know come at you in life and to be able to test those things to see what they really are so that you know what to do. You have news thrown at you. and You're able to test it against what the Lord and His Word says so that you actually know what to do with that information. To be faced with choices. To not just have to guess on what we should do. But to be able to actually test those choices. Those things against the word of God. To see if they align with who God actually is. And what his word teaches. And then to make right and good decisions. Man, what a treasure this is. Please hear me. Good decision making is the fruit of growth. It really is. If you've made a lot of bad decisions lately, can I just say, you need to grow in Christ. You're, you're, not, you're not testing correctly. You're not approving correctly. You're headed the wrong ways. You need to grow. Well, notice the next words. Verse 10, that you may be sincere and without, without offense until the day of of Jesus Christ. The word sincere there means to be real, genuine. Um, if you don't know me, uh, one of my highest values, one of the things that I value above many, many other things is genuineness, sincerity, reality. I do not want your veneer. 
I don't care. In fact, my goal is to push right through everybody's veneer all the time. You're probably like, that's why I don't like talking to you. And I'm like, I got you. I understand. <laughs> but I hate it. I, I am a terrible small talker. Terrible. How's it going? Good. How's it going with you? Good. Okay. What's the Lord doing in your life? Oh, that's a little aggressive, you know? <laughs> you okay? Things all right? Listen, I, I, I just, I can't do it. I, I, if you've got a front, if you've got a veneer, just know I'm going to try to get through that. If I can't get through it, I'm going to keep trying. <laughs> but like, seriously, right? Like, we want to be real, there's no point in faking. There's no point in fronting. There's no point in putting up an appearance. What's the point of any of that? There's no point in any of it. Sincere, and it's a mark of growth that we don't have to try to hide, that we don't put up the wall. Sincere, and that's what Paul's praying for, that you may be genuine. That's the word here, genuine, that you may be real, that you might be what you actually are is what we see and what we know and what we hear. He says, and without offense. It means, uh, really, a, a, it means it's going to result in a life that is um, honoring to the Lord because the words without offense mean not to trip or stumble or fall. Okay? So another proof of real growth in our lives is that you are real, you're not fake, okay, you're not trying to hide anything. Yeah, you're, you're not perfect. None of us are. But you're also not saying you're one thing and actually being something else. You're not faking it. We're, we're real followers of Christ. But then one of the fruits of real growth is, um, is, uh, is a godliness. It's a, it's a life that is, is being pruned. You know, genuineness, the reality of your faith is something that is very precious to God. Did you know that? The Bible says this in 1 Peter 1, 7. It says that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revealing of Jesus Christ. God really, really, really wants you to be real. Genuine. You say, but if, if people see what I actually am, they're not going to like that. Yeah, that's where you go to the Lord, right? To change. And, uh, and I would take a shot with others on whether they'll hang with you. If they know and love the Lord, they will. But listen, all of this is going to result in godliness, the words without offense, to not trip over, to not fall down. It's the picture of a road, right? It's your path in life. You're, you're walking along this path, and it's the picture of trying to walk carefully in life, and you're watching out now for those things that would trip you up, that would cause you to stumble or cause you to fall. The words without offense mean to not trip and fall. And so it means that we, we will look at our lives and we'll sweep the path clean, the road clean, if you will. We consider the things in our life and we think, we ask ourselves, is this sin? Is this going to stunt my growth? Get rid of it. Get rid of it. And then we take it even a step further and we say, well, is this even helpful for me? Is this going to slow my growth? The Apostle Paul said it this way, all things are lawful for me, meaning I could make a case for anything that is not specifically called sin. Right? We could do that. I could make a case to watch endless hours of sports. It's not inherently sinful. I could make a case for that. All things are lawful. But, he, but here's the question when you start to grow. Here's the question. Are, is that helpful? Is that helpful? I'm not knocking sports. I'm just saying, we put Netflix there, right? Put, put your phone there. Put any number of things in that category. It's not sin. It's not sin for me to go out to eat. But it might not be helpful for you to go out to eat every single night, right? So we say all things, Paul says all things are lawful. I can make a case for anything that's not called sin to be lawful. But not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me. But Paul says, but I will not be brought under the power or the control of anything. Growth asks that question. Not only is it sinful, but is it helpful? Think about growth in a tree. Sometimes the issue 
uh, in a tree, uh, it, all that needs to happen is pruning, right? Within a tree, uh, sometimes the issue in terms of growth is you just need to prune branches off so that things will grow again, right? In other words, vital branches are not receiving what they need because there's so many branches, Sometimes our growth as Christians is like this. It slows because we have too many branches taking resources. You're like, man, I don't feel like I'm growing. Do you have too many branches right now? Too many distractions taking your focus and so you're not growing. Too many things taking your maintenance and your care, and so you're not growing. Too many relationships slowing your growth in the vital relationships. Sometimes what might be needed, if you're not dead, if, if you don't have ongoing disease of sin, sometimes what might be needed is pruning. Like, man, you know what? I am spread too thin. I cannot give myself to the things that really matter. Maybe that's the situation that you're in. Well, notice the last words of verse 10. And man, they are a needed reminder. And it says, until the day of Jesus Christ. Can I remind you of what Paul is reminding us here? Jesus Christ is coming. He is coming. Um, people have laughed that idea off forever. And guess what? One of these days, he's going to. And we are sooner now to his appearing than we have ever been, right? I know that's an obvious statement, but we really are. And he is going to come, and maybe it's today. Maybe it's right now. Maybe it's in a minute. I don't know about you, but I want to be doing what he wants me to be doing when he appears. Think about that for a second. I want to be doing what the Lord wants me to be doing when he appears. I don't want to be unashamed when he returns. And this is something that we are warned about in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. It warns us, it says, Now, little children, abide in him. It says, Grow. And that when he appears, watch this, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. It goes on and it says, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. The idea here, he is coming. And I do not want to be doing anything that, he, that, would, that would cause me to be ashamed when he appears. The word ashamed there means to turn my face away from in, in, in shame and sorrow and pain. I do not want to be doing anything that God would not be happy with. I want him to be happy with my life. Man, growth as a believer tells me, man, I'm going to go and I'm going I'm to cut those things off. I'm going I'm, I'm to get rid of those things because his appearing is near. Man, we could... Spend so much more time here, but I just want to read verse 11 and then we'll close this morning. It says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Just understand that all growth comes through him. You cannot grow on your own. You can't make those things happen. It only comes through him. It's by Jesus Christ. You say, how do I grow? Draw near to him. How do I grow? Confess to him. How do I grow? Go to him. How do I grow? Depend on him. How do I grow? Cry out to him. It's through him. He becomes more and more in our lives. So the question is, are you growing? If not, we need to look at why. And again, maybe it's as simple as just needing to prune some things in your life. I would encourage you to do that now. While you have the clarity of mind to do it, prune those things away. He's coming. But maybe you've realized it's because of sin. And so you need to sweep the road clean. There are things that are tripping you up and so you're not growing. Do it today. He's coming. 
Maybe you've realized today, though, that it's actually because you're dead. You're not alive spiritually. And that is very simple. You just must turn to him. It's through him that we become alive. And it's through him that we grow. It's through him. Through him alone. Let's turn to him together. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your mercy and your kindness. Lord, I just pray for every person here and every person hearing through the stream. I just pray that, Lord, you would help us, Lord, to do what you have called us to do in order to grow. Help us, Lord, to prune off the things that we're supposed to. Help us, Lord, to sweep the road clean from the things that are tripping us up. Help us, Lord, to cut out the disease, the the sin from our lives. Lord, I also pray for any person here watching that may not actually be alive. You've realized that today you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and now is the time to turn to him. Not to wait till you get home, not to wait till something else happens, but to humble yourself and to repent, to pray right now, to turn to him in brokenness and admission and and confession of sin, to repent and believe, the scriptures say, that you might have life. Turn to Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin, for salvation, asking him to save you. He will be faithful to do it. We thank you, Lord. We love you. Thank you for being so faithful and good to us. We give you our hearts and we give you our lives. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.